Committee will come to order. Today we are continuing our investigation of a Bank of America's acquisition of Merrill Lynch. This was a most unusual transaction. On September the 15th, 2008, Bank of America announced that it was purchasing Merrill Lynch, creating one of the nation's largest financial institutions. At the time, it was a merger negotiated between two private parties, designed for the exclusive benefits of private shareholders and paid for exclusively with private money. Four months later, on January the 16th, 2009, the world discovered that Merrill Lynch had experienced a $15 billion fourth quarter loss. Most importantly, we discovered that the merger had taken place only after the federal government had committed to give Bank of America $20 billion in taxpayer money. In short, Bank of America's acquisition of Merrill Lynch began in September 2008 as a private business deal and was completed in January 2009 with a $20 billion tax bailout. What happened in the interim? has been shrouded in secrecy. But the broad outline is this. When Bank of America urged its shareholders to approve the acquisition of Merrill Lynch on December the 5th, 2008, there was no public disclosure of any problems with the transaction. However, Bank of America's CEO, Ken Lewis, has testified that just nine days after the shareholder vote, he discovered a $12 billion loss at Merrill Lynch. Mr. Lewis said he told then Treasury Secretary Hank Paulson that he was strongly considering backing out of the deal. According to Lewis, Paulson ultimately told him that if he didn't go through with the acquisition, he and the board would be fired. Internal emails we have obtained from the Federal Reserve indicates officials there were very skeptical about Mr. Lewis's motives in threatening to back out of the Merrill deal. Fed Chairman Ben Bernanke thought Lewis was using the Merrill losses as a bargaining chip to obtain federal funds. FDIC Chairwoman Sheila Baer was opposed to providing assistance, saying, my board does not want to do this. In essence, Ken Lewis claimed that the government made me do it. But was Bank of America forced to go through with the deal, or was this just an old-fashioned shakedown? These questions are particularly important given the administration's new proposal to give broad new powers to the Federal Reserve. I believe that before Congress acts on the President's financial services reform proposal, we need to have a thorough understanding of what caused the current financial crisis and how the federal government responded. Unfortunately, much of what the Fed, the Treasury, and other agencies did in these transactions remain shrouded in secrecy. It's time to yank the shard of the, off the feds and shine some light on these events. The Bank of America Merrill Lynch deal is a case in point. New emails we have obtained from the Fed indicate that Fed officials may have attempted to keep other agencies in the dark about what was going on. A Fed email discusses not telling the office of the control of the currency, what is happening. Others discuss how to minimize the amount of information given to the SEC. In a remarkable exchange, Fed officials note that an SEC official can be counted on to be discreet. I'm not going to prejudge the issues. At this point, we are not even close to finishing this investigation. 
Bank of America CEO Ken Lewis gave us his story. Now it's Fed Chairman Bernanke's turn to give his side of the story. Next, it will be former Treasury Secretary Hank Paulson to give his side. We need to get all the facts out on the table before we are in a position to say what happened and when it happened. But I promise you this. We will follow this investigation wherever the road leads, and we will do our best to make sure the facts get out on the table where everyone can see them by subpoena if necessary. Let me stop and thank Chairman Bernanke for coming today uh, to this hearing. And I look forward to your testimony. I now yield five minutes to our ranking member on the full committee, Mr. Darrell Issa of California, for his statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this uh, second hearing in a series today. Our work together on a bipartisan basis should, in fact, be a model for all the members of Congress. Today, Chairman Bernanke is here as part of this process, not because of one side or the other, but because we came to a consensus that for all the good work in a financial crisis, oversight still needed to discover what was or wasn't done, was it consistent with the kind of behavior behind closed doors that we would like to always know is going on, even when appropriately government shares information only discreetly with other government agencies. Additionally, yours and my role as reformers is critical in a process in which the President's financial reform system or a proposal has included broad and sweeping increases in Chairman Bernanke or his successor's powers. Additionally, former Secretary Paulson, acting in good faith and in concert, in fact deserves his opportunity to tell us about the events. Let there be no doubt, Mr. Chairman, all of us on the dais are aware that 24-7 Leaders of the Fed, the Treasury, the FDIC, the OCC, and the SEC all worked diligently to get us, get us out of a financial crisis that was many years in the making, in almost every case not something in which the, those getting us out participated in, in a direct way, and in fact was done in the best interest of the American people. And I want to thank Chairman Bernanke for his effort and his major role in that effort, which is still ongoing today. Through the uh, committee's investigation, we have learned the federal government, led by both Chairman Bernanke and then Secretary Paulson, made certain threats against Ken Lewis during a time in which he was, in fact, considering pulling out or renegotiating the Merrill Lynch merger. There have been conflicting reports under oath by Ken Lewis and by uh, Secretary Paulson about what occurred. To, to his credit, Chairman Bernanke has been quick to give us written responses, both publicly and privately, that today we would hope lead to a, clear, a, a thorough understanding of whether, in fact, there is a vast misunderstanding of what a threat was, what the intent was, whether or not uh, what we often call and I have called a cover-up was in fact simply appropriately determining why an agency should be not informed. I for one personally doubt that all of these can be explained away, but it is very possible that today hindsight will show us that if we all had to do it ag again, we would do it differently. I think it's important today that we give Chairman Bernanke a full and complete opportunity to talk about the environment in which he was working, his desires and reasons for doing what he did, and where discussions that he might or should or could uh, perhaps replace the board and the CEO of Bank of America may have in fact been blown out of uh, proportion, may have been misunderstood. I for one though am looking at Main Street America the stockholders who in some cases got less than they would have gotten through other means. Uh, this includes Chrysler, General Motors, 
and, of course, Bank of America and Merrill Lynch. I'm also deeply concerned that going forward, if the systemic risk proposal by the President, which would give vast authority over any entity, bank or otherwise, that represents a potential systemic risk, is to be given to an agency. And if that, uh, Mr. Chairman, is to be uh, the Fed, and if that power is, uh, is used, what will be the oversight? What will be the consultation? How will we know that although the Fed has the lead, will the SEC, the OCC, and other agencies charged with their responsibilities always be kept informed? I appreciate today, Mr. Chairman, that not everyone on the dais agrees that the focus is on what was done behind closed doors relating to uh, this merger. Others may say, and it is their prerogative, that the question is, what did officers and directors of these companies do? I, for one, am also uh, interested to hear that, but today, primarily, I would like to understand how we can have statements made by government officials be so different and why the evidence provided today to us in the way of emails and other documentation appears to see changes and disagreements that cannot be explained away. Mr. Chairman, I look forward to uh, continuing this on a bipartisan basis. Your support and friendship and our ability to work together in a way not often found in Congress has made this, this Congress more effective, this committee more effective, and I thank you for your service and yield back. Thank you very much. I thank the ranking member for his statement and thank him for his words uh, uh, as well, uh, kind words. At uh, this time, I yield to the ranking member of the uh, subcommittee on uh, domestic policy, and of course, uh, um, uh, for five minutes, and um, the gentleman from Cleveland who has done a fantastic job, uh, Congressman Kucinich. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman uh, and Chairman Bernanke. Contrary to the popularly held belief that the government went too far in the Bank of America Merrill Lynch deal, our investigation reveals that what is remarkable is what the government did not do. In two meetings in December 2008, Bank of America's Ken Lewis asserted that he had only recently become aware of the deteriorating situation at Merrill Lynch. He asserted that he believed he could justify invoking the Material Adverse Effect Clause, the MAC, to back out of the deal. And he asserted that he needed considerable help from the government, including $13 billion more in new cash, as well as protection from Merrill Lynch's losses. Staff and officials at the Fed looked more closely at the basis for Lewis's assertions and determined, and this is a quote, that they were, quote, somewhat suspect, unquote. The Fed found, in contradiction to Ken Lewis's representations, that Bank of America failed to do adequate due diligence in acquiring Merrill Lynch. The Fed found that Bank of America had known about accelerating losses at Merrill Lynch since mid-November, when shareholders could have used that information to decide on a ratification of the merger. And senior officials at the Fed believed that Bank of America could be in violation of securities laws for failing to inform shareholders about the Merrill Lynch losses known in mid-November. Furthermore, they believe that Ken Lewis's threat of invoking a MAC was a bargaining chip and was not credible, that Bank of America was experiencing its own losses independent of Merrill Lynch and needed to be bailed out itself, and that there were serious doubts about the competence of Bank of America's management. Yet, in spite of the Fed's doubts, felt about Ken Lewis's management of Bank of America, the Fed's leadership orchestrated an aid package that attached no meaningful conditions to the money. The Fed required no changes whatsoever in Bank of America's deficient corporate leadership. The Fed even gave Bank of America more money than what Ken Lewis had originally asked for. The disconnection between the Fed's analysis of what went wrong at Bank of America and what the Fed was willing to do about it is significant for all of us and is the subject of today's hearing. If the Bank of America, of America Merrill Lynch merger posed a systemic risk in December 2008, the post-rescue merger entity continues to pose a systemic risk or a potential systemic risk in 2009. 
if bad decisions by corporate management can have systemic consequences, then the Fed's remedy in the Bank of America Merrill Lynch case amplifies the risk posed by poor corporate leadership because it signals that incompetence practiced by the management of a very large financial institution will be subsidized, not punished, by government regulators. The Fed's decision-making process in the Bank of America Merrill Lynch merger makes the case for a significant increase in accountability at the Fed. Its regulation of systemic risk needs to be subject to congressional oversight. Its interventions in markets to recover from the current financial crisis need to be audited by the Government Accountability Office, as I've proposed in a bill and in an amendment adopted unanimously by this committee. We can't afford to make the Fed a super regulator, as some have proposed, without also increasing its transparency in meaningful ways, as this committee has proposed through the Kucinich Amendment. I want to thank the Chairman for uh, the opportunity to work with you uh, on this hearing, and I look forward to uh, Mr. Bernanke's testimony, and I want to thank you, sir, for being here today. Thank you. Thank the gentleman from Ohio. We will now yield five minutes to the uh, ranking member of the Domestic Policy Subcommittee, Congressman Jordan of Ohio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a brief statement here. Um, thank you for holding today's hearing on the government's involvement in the Bank of America's deal to purchase Merrill Lynch. I appreciate Chairman Bernanke's appearance before the committee today. His testimony is important to bring further transparency to the role of the Federal Government in the Bank of America Merrill Lynch transaction and the overall financial crisis. I am troubled by the information and documents that the Committee's investigation has uncovered. They show that Mr. Bernanke and Mr. Paulson threatened to fire Ken Lewis and his Board of Directors in order to force the Bank of America to acquire Merrill Lynch. I recognize that these actions took place in a time of significant economic challenges and uncertainty, but there must be limits to government action even in the time of crisis, and those limits must be respected. We must also keep in mind that this pressure was exerted after many of the nation's banks were forced to accept taxpayer money through the TARP program. We know that in October of 2008, Mr. Paulson, Mr. Bernanke, Mr. Geithner, and Ms. Baer brought the CEOs of the largest private banks in America to the Treasury Department and demanded that they accept the partial nationalization of their banks. I look forward to learning more about Mr. Bernanke's role in this process as well. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. I would ask for unanimous consent to include in the record uh, majority and minority uh, reports and all documents referenced in those, uh, in those uh, hearing, or, or reports. Without Thank objection, you. so ordered. Um, <coughs> Mr. Bernanke, it's a long-standing policy that we swear all of our witnesses in. Will you please uh, stand and raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? If so, answer in the affirmative. I do. Let the record reflect that the witness answered in the affirmative. Uh, Mr. Bernanke, um, uh, we would like for you to summarize your statement in five minutes, in which will allow the members to raise questions with you. And of course, we have a light there. Uh, when it starts out, it starts out on green, and then it goes into yellow, and then it goes into red. Red means stop. So we thank you for that. Thank you very much. You may begin. Thank you. Chairman Towns, Ranking Member Issa, and other members of the committee, about now. Now? Now? Okay. Chairman Towns, Ranking Member Issa, and other members of the committee, I appreciate the opportunity to discuss the Federal Reserve's role in the acquisition by the Bank of America of Merrill Lynch. You know, uh, is it on? Staff, help me. Because we can't hear him. Pull it, pull it closer. Just pull it closer to you. The light on, right? yes. I believe that the Federal Reserve acted with the highest integrity throughout its discussions you with know, Bank of America. You know, still, we're still having trouble. Yep. Uh, we, we have some senior citizens up here. Okay. <laughs> we're having trouble hearing you. <laughs> yeah. Is there any way you can turn the volume up on it? We've got a replacement <laughs> down below, too. Another one? Yeah. There's another one on the floor? And back up on the floor? Staff? Yes. Yes. 
sound better. How's that? Very better, good. very better. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. I'd Mr. like the full extent of my time, if I if I if I may. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that the Federal Reserve acted with the highest integrity throughout its discussions with the Bank of America regarding that company's acquisition of Merrill Lynch. I will attempt in this testimony to respond to some of the questions that have been raised. On September 15, 2008, the Bank of America announced an agreement to acquire Merrill Lynch. I did not play a role in arranging this transaction and no Federal Reserve assistance was promised or provided in connection with that agreement. As with similar transactions, the transaction was reviewed and approved by the Federal Reserve under the Bank Holding Company Act in November 2008. It was subsequently approved by the shareholders of Bank of America and Merrill Lynch on December 5th. The acquisition was scheduled to be closed on January 1st, 2009. As you know, the period encompassing Bank of America's decision to acquire Merrill Lynch through the consummation of the merger was one of extreme stress in financial markets. The government-sponsored enterprises, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, were taken into conservatorship a week before the Bank of America deal was announced. That same week, Lehman Brothers failed and American International Group was prevented from failing only by extraordinary government action. Later that month, Wachovia faced intense liquidity pressures which threatened its viability and resulted in its acquisition by Wells Fargo. In mid-October, an aggressive international response was required to avert a global banking meltdown. In November, the possible destabilization of Citigroup was prevented by government action. In short, the period was one of extraordinary risk for the financial system and the global economy, as well as for Bank of America and Merrill Lynch. On December 17, 2008, senior management of Bank of America informed the Federal Reserve for the first time that because of significant losses at Merrill Lynch for the fourth quarter of 2008, Bank of America was considering not closing the Merrill Lynch acquisition. This information led to a series of meetings and discussions among Bank of America, the regulatory agencies, and the Treasury. During these discussions, Bank of America CEO Ken Lewis told us that the company was considering invoking the Material Adverse Event Clause in the acquisition contract known as the MAC in an attempt to rescind its agreement to acquire Merrill Lynch. In responding to Bank of America in these discussions, I expressed concern that invoking the MAC would entail significant risks, not only for the financial system as a whole, but also for Bank of America itself for three reasons. First, in light of the extreme fragility of the financial system at that time, the uncertainties created by an invocation of the MAC might have triggered a broader systemic crisis that could well have destabilized Bank of America as well as Merrill Lynch. Second, an attempt to invoke the MAC after three months of review, preparation, and public remarks by the management of Bank of America about the benefits of the acquisition would cast doubt in the minds of financial market participants, including the investors, creditors, and customers of Bank of America, about the due diligence and analysis done by the company, its capability to consummate significant acquisitions, its overall risk management processes, and the judgment of its management. Third. Based on our staff analysis of legal issues, we believe that it was highly unlikely that Bank of America would be successful in terminating the contract by invoking the MAC. Rather, an attempt to invoke the MAC would likely involve extended and costly litigation with Merrill Lynch that with significant probability would result in Bank of America being required either to pay substantial damages or to acquire a firm whose value would have been greatly reduced or destroyed by the strong negative market reaction to the announcement. For these reasons, I believe that, rather than invoking the MAC, Bank of America's best option and the best option for the system was to work with the Federal Reserve and the Treasury to develop a contingency plan to ensure that the company would remain stable should the completion of the acquisition and the announcement of losses lead to financial stress, particularly a sudden pullback of funding of the type that had been experienced by Wachovia, Lehman, and other firms. Ultimately, on December 30th, the Bank of America Board determined to go forward with the acquisition. The staff of the Federal Reserve worked diligently with Treasury, other regulators, and Bank of America to put in place a package that would help shore up the combined company's financial position and reduce the risk of market disruption. The plan was completed in time to be announced simultaneously with Bank of America's public earnings announcement, which had been moved forward to January 16th from January 20th. The package included an additional $20 billion equity investment from the Troubled Asset Relief Program and a loss protection arrangement, or ring fence, 
for a pool of assets valued at about $118 billion. The ring fence arrangement has not been consummated, and Bank of America now believes that, in light of the general improvement in the markets, this protection is no longer needed. Importantly, the decision to go forward with the merger rightly remained in the hands of Bank of America's board and management, and they were obligated to make the choice that they believed was in the best interest of the shareholders and the company. I did not tell Bank of America's management that the Federal Reserve would take action against the board or management if they decided to proceed with the MAC. Moreover, I did not instruct anyone to indicate to Bank of America that the Federal Reserve would take any particular action under those circumstances. I agreed with the view of others that the invocation of the MAC clause in this case involves significant risk for Bank of America, as well as for Merrill Lynch and the financial system as a whole, and it was this concern that I communicated to Mr. Lewis and his colleagues. The Federal Reserve also acted appropriately regarding issues of public disclosure. As I wrote in a letter to this committee, neither I nor any member of the Federal Reserve ever directed, instructed, or advised the Bank of America to withhold from public disclosure any information relating to Merrill Lynch, including its losses, compensation packages or bonuses, or any other related matter. These disclosure obligations belong squarely with the company, and the Federal Reserve did not interfere in the company's disclosure decisions. The Federal Reserve had a legitimate interest in knowing when Bank of America or Merrill Lynch intended to disclose those losses at Merrill Lynch. Given the fragility of the financial markets at that time, we were concerned about the potential for a strong adverse market reaction to the reports of significant losses at Merrill Lynch. If federal assistance to stabilize these companies were to be effective, the necessary facilities would have to be in place as of the disclosure date. Thus, our planning was importantly influenced by the company's planned disclosure schedule. But the decisions and responsibilities regarding public disclosure always remained, as it should, with the companies themselves. A related question is whether there should have been earlier disclosure of the aid provided by the U.S. government to the Bank of America. Importantly, there was no commitment on the part of the government regarding the size or structure of the transaction until very late in the process. Although we had indicated to Bank of America in December that the government would provide assistance if necessary to keep the company from being destabilized, as it had done in other cases during this time of extraordinary stress in financial markets, those December discussions were followed in January by significant and intense negotiations involving the Bank of America, the Federal Reserve, the Treasury, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, and the Office of the Controller of the Currency regarding many key aspects of the assistance transaction, including the type of assistance to be provided, the size of the protection, the assets to be covered, the terms for payments, the fees, and the length of the facility. The agreement in principle on these items was reflected in a term sheet that was not finalized until just before its public release on January 16, 2009. The Federal Reserve Board and the Treasury completely and appropriately disclosed the information as required by the Congress in the Emergency Economic Stabilization Act of 2008. In retrospect, I believe that our actions in this episode, including the development of assistance package that facilitated the consummation of Bank of America's acquisition of Merrill Lynch, were done not only with the highest integrity, but have strengthened both companies while enhancing the stability of the financial markets and protecting the taxpayers. These actions were taken under highly unusual circumstances in the face of grave threats to our financial system and our economy. To avoid such situations in the future, it is critical that the administration, the Congress, and the regulatory agencies work together to develop a new framework that strengthens and expands supervisory oversight and includes a broader range of tools to promote financial stability. I'd be pleased to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you um, very much for your, uh, your testimony. Uh, I will begin with uh, questions, and then, of course, we will allow each member to uh, have questions. Uh, Chairman Bernanke, uh, did you instruct Hank Paulson to tell Ken Lewis that he and his board would be fired if they backed out of Merrill, the Merrill deal? I did not. Well, I understand that Mr. Paulson told Mr. Cuomo that uh, you did. I just want to share that with you. I did not instruct Mr. Paulson or anyone else to convey such a uh, threat or uh, message to Mr. Lewis. Did you personally tell Mr. Lewis that you would fire him or remove the Bank of America board if Mr. Lewis backed out of the Merrill Lynch deal? Did I did not. 
Ken Lewis testified under oath here and also told his board of directors that you and Mr. Paulson made verbal commitments to him in December of 2008 to provide Bank of America with enough money to fill the hole created by the $12 billion loss at Merrill Lynch. In December of 2008, did you promise Mr. Lewis that you would provide Bank of America with enough capital to fill the $12 billion hole created by the losses at Merrill Lynch? I did not promise any specific amount of money. What was committed was uh, the commitment of the government to work in good faith with Bank of America to develop a contingency plan that would assure the viability of the company in case of a financial crisis. Chairman Bernanke, in an email the committee recently obtained under subpoena to a top employee of the New York Federal Reserve, communicates with your general counsel regarding questions the SEC had about the Bank of America bailout. Can you explain why Bank of America would complain about someone talking to the SEC and why it appears that Federal Reserve employees were not completely forthcoming with the SEC about what was going on at Bank of America? Chairman, I can't speak for Bank of America, but I'll explain the Federal Reserve's position. Uh, first of all, the Federal Reserve throughout this process has worked closely and collaboratively with the other regulatory agencies. Um, as you know, the SEC has two specific functions. One relates to disclosure, and the uh, Federal Reserve had no issues relating to disclosure. Those were issues for Bank of America and its shareholders. Its second function has to do with um, oversight regulation. In that capacity, I'm sure the SEC already knew about the losses at Merrill Lynch. From our perspective, the issue was that we needed to work with Bank of America to develop a package that would assure the viability of the company in case of financial instability. The Bank of America's regulators, besides ourselves, were the Office of the Controller of the Currency and the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, whom we involved uh, continually throughout the process, in which I personally spoke to both John Dugan and Sheila Baer to make sure they were well informed about the situation. So you're saying that uh, you were forthcoming? I was indeed as appropriate with the, with the other agencies. In another email we obtained recently, the head of the FDIC says to you there is strong discomfort with the Bank of America bailout package and that the FDIC board does not want to do this. Uh, Mr. Bernanke, what were the concerns at the FDIC about the Bank of America's bailout and why did you and the Treasury Department go through with the bailout despite the concerns that the FDIC had? My recollection of the FDIC's concerns were not with the issues of trying to prevent instability. Their concern was the FDIC's own financial exposure to the deal. They noted that Merrill Lynch was not a bank and therefore they wanted to be sure to restrict whatever uh, financial resources they committed to be relevant to the bank rather than to the acquired company. So they had concerns about the structure of the deal as it related to their own uh, financial exposure, but in the end, of course, they did uh, agree to uh, contribute to the uh, arrangement that the government put together. Right. Ken Lewis told the committee two weeks ago that he called you and asked you to put in writing the verbal committee commitment he said you and Hank Paulson made to him regarding a government bailout of the Merrill Lynch deal. What did, did he say to you exactly during that phone call? What did he say? He, he wanted to know if we could provide a written uh, description of the commitment that he could use uh, with his board. Um, we were unable to provide such a uh, written description because we did not have any deal. We didn't have a transaction completed at that point, and so there was nothing specific that we could commit to. All we had was a good faith agreement to work together to find some uh, arrangement that would help avoid destabilization of the Bank of America. Right. Uh, my time has expired. I yield to the ranking member from California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Minutes. Following up on the Chairman's uh, line of questioning, you said you kept the OCC informed and had personal conversations. Can you explain from your own information you provided to us why uh, Brian Peters of the Federal Reserve Bank in New York would say 
Given the presence of the OCC on the call, I think we should not discuss or reference the call with Ken Lewis and Paulson. I don't know precisely what motivated that. Um, all I can tell you is that uh, on the 21st, we had uh, two conference calls, which I participated in and which John Dugan participated in, and we provided him with all the information that I was aware of at that time. Okay. The, uh, uh, the email that we received from uh, Jeffrey uh, Lacker, Federal Reserve uh, Bank of Richmond, uh, that, uh, that indicates that, uh, that, in fact, they felt there was pressure related to the MAC. Uh, how do you explain that? Uh, is that just another independent person that misunderstood? Well, I don't recall the details of that conversation, but I'd like to make uh, two points. Uh, first, as no, I said, well, let me let me just give you the details to make it accurate. Just pro, quote: Just had a long talk with Ben (parentheses Bernanke) sa says that they think the MAC threat is irrelevant because it's not credible. Also intends to make it even more clear that if they play that card and they need exist assistance, management is gone. Now. Is he misunderstanding what the conversation he had with you in those quotations? I don't recollect everything that was said in that conversation. I'd just like to make, again, two points, if I may. I, I just, I'd like to have your rec your rec do you Do you believe that he is incorrect, according to your rec recollection? Because he's saying, in a nutshell, you planned to make a threat. Now, you may not have done it, but he's saying you planned. Is he lying, or is he I don't recollect the details of that conversation. I'd like to say two things, if I may. First, that as you point out, I never did make a threat. I never did raise this issue with uh, Ken Lewis, the Bank of America. Did you, think that, did you think pulling the trigger on the MAC was, uh, was a bargaining chip? May I make my second point? No. Briefly, I'm, no, I briefly, have very limited time. I'd just like to point out that what Mr. Lacker referred to was not, he didn't say that if Lewis were to not invoke the MAC that he would be fired. He said if he were to invoke the MAC, and that he required assistance, then there would be consequences. I think if somebody makes a decision that re results in their company uh, failing and being rescued by the government, I think there should be consequences for well, that. Well, let's go through the MAC. Uh, you know, you, you threw money in uh, almost on a daily basis without informing Congress that you planned to do it because events were moving that quickly that you discovered and officers and directors of company after company AIG, Wachovia, you name it, made these discoveries and came to you and you became aware of it on a daily basis. Isn't that true? We, we learned about some of these problems at a very late date. That's true. Okay. So let me just put this in perspective. The Fed, the Treasury, the SEC, the FDIC, they were unable to predict on a day-by-day -day basis who was going to be next. That's what we all saw publicly and privately here. So why is it that between September and December, one would think that it was a complete absence of fair due diligence to discover that a company you're seeking to acquire that we held hearings on because of Stan O'Neill's alleged mismanagement of that company had deteriorated quickly and that they had not anticipated toxic assets going bad quickly. Why would that be unreasonable to assume in a deal in the environment in which day after day after day you're watching collapses of 100-year-old businesses? Well, we did, we did raise the question of whether or not the Bank of America should have discovered those losses earlier. Uh, but that wasn't the relevant question for us in terms of make, maintaining the stability of the financial system going well, okay, forward. Okay, but we're not talking about the stability of the financial systems. You said that you had three good reasons that B of A should not pull out, and one of them was that their credibility would be adversely affected and the whole market would be adversely affected if, if they couldn't have predicted in two months of due diligence uh, by a company trying to get high dollar, or in this case high, high stock exchange, uh, in the transaction. So you have an arm's length transaction in which people are trying to tell you only what they need to tell you to get the highest stock. And you're saying that basically in one of your three points that they'd be viewed as inept. Well, if I understand correctly, day after day after day, regulators were discovering, oh, blank, another one's dropping and the market is seizing up. In that environment, wouldn't it have been just as easy to say, you're, evoke, you're looking at invoking the MAC. What are you trying to get to? Is your 
80 cents to one dollar exchange rate of stock, is it in fact materially different and would you still go through with the deal but just at a slightly different amount? Wouldn't that be the ordinary effect rather than to say directly and indirectly a number of people clearly communicated, including Paulson, that, that, that they would in fact have to go through with this deal or else? It was my view and the view of our staff that if they tried to invoke the MAC, that the market would understand that the chances of their actually consummating, uh, that of, of the MAC being successful, was quite low. And as a result, both Merrill Lynch and Bank of America would probably be affected by a financial crisis at that, at that moment, and that was our concern. Right. Thank the you, Mr. Chairman. time has expired. I now yield five minutes to the gentleman from uh, Ohio, Congressman Kucinich. Chairman Bernanke. Our investigation reveals that staff at the Fed quickly came to the conclusion that Ken Lewis's representations to the government in the meeting of December 17, 2008 were, as one put it, somewhat suspect. At the appropriate time, I'm going to insert into the record a number of documents that show that senior staff and officials at the Fed believed, in contradiction to Ken Lewis's representations, that Bank of America failed to do adequate due diligence in acquiring Merrill Lynch. The Fed found that Bank of America had known about accelerating losses at Merrill since mid-November when shareholders could have used that information to decide on ratification of the merger. Your colleague, Governor Warsh, doubted the competence of Bank of America's top management to address the problems at Merrill and at Bank of America, writing to you, and I quote, spoke with folks, uh, with BOA folks this morning, mostly Joe Price, CFO, did not instill a ton of confidence that they have got a comprehensive handle on the situation, unquote. And the senior lawyer at the Fed believed that Bank of America could be in violation of securities laws for failing to inform shareholders about the Merrill losses known in mid-November. Mid and this is writing to you, quote, Lewis should been, have been aware of the problem at Merrill Lynch earlier, perhaps as early as mid-November, and not caught by surprise. That could cause other problems for him around the disclosures B.A. made for the shareholder vote, unquote. Chairman Bernanke, did you agree with your senior staff and colleagues at the Fed who had drawn those unflattering conclusions about Ken Lewis's management at Bank of America? The staff and the principals at the Fed had serious concerns and questions did about... Did you have serious concerns? I did have concerns and questions, but... You know, about that wasn't the, the issue. About the characteristics of the I did manager. have concerns, yes. Our investigation also finds that there was considerable interest at the staff level in the Fed to attach meaningful conditions to whatever aid package you gave Bank of America because of doubts about the quality of management of Bank of America. However, it's not evident that you yourself had an interest in increasing accountability of Bank of America's management. In talking points prepared by your staff for a conversation you would have with Bank of America, a number of restrictions were seriously proposed to accompany any federal aid to Bank of America. I'd like to go through some of these suggested conditions and assess whether you, in fact, imposed those conditions on Bank of America. Did you require any changes in Bank of America's top management in view of the considerable evidence amassed by your staff that Ken Lewis had not done adequate due diligence and may have committed securities fraud? Subsequently to the transaction, we have asked and required Bank of America to look at its top management and they have made changes in their board. Was, there, was that a yes or a no? The answer is yes, we have done that. Okay. Did you require more severe economic or uh, executive compensation limitations for Bank of America than had uh, been required under the TARP program in which the conditions were deliberately not intended to be onerous so as to maximize participation by banks that did not need financial assistance? I believe the, the executive compensation restrictions that were imposed were those not the standard ones, but the ones associated with extraordinary actions. Did, under you TARP. Require, did you require any limitation on various types of corporate expenses at Bank of America other than those it had already imposed on itself? Not that I recall. Did you require a government foreclosure policy such as was imposed by the FDIC in the case of IndyMac? Yes, I believe we did. I believe we did. You believe? Do you know for sure? I'll get back to you, but it's my belief that we did. We, we, need, we need to know that. Now, Chairman Bernanke, isn't it true that there was a high-level concern at the Fed about neglecting the opportunity to press for greater accountability in Bank of America's corporate management? Let me direct your attention 
to an email sent to you by Eric Rosengren, president of the Boston Fed, says, Dear Ben, I'm concerned if we too quickly move to a ring fence strategy, particularly if we believe that existing management is a significant source of the problem and that they do not have a good grasp of the extent of their problems and appropriate strategies to resolve them. I think it's instructive to look at the example of the Royal Bank of Scotland, the UK, replace senior management. The bank is maintaining operations without significant disruptions. I would, want, uh, would not want to discard this op option prematurely. That's a quote. Now, Chairman Bernanke, Ken Lewis came to you with a story that the Fed didn't believe. You were getting advice from your staff and from peers that considerable concessions should be required of Bank of America because of concern about the quality of top management. And yet you decided to give the aid away without any meaningful changes to Bank of America's corporate management or its compensation policies. How do you explain that, Chairman? Uh, Congressman, the supervisory process is not a one-time thing. It's an ongoing process. And in our ongoing supervisory process, we have made demands of the Bank of America in terms of their so board and management. So you give them the money first, and then you start supervising? Well, we have the ability to uh, insist on these changes at any point. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Right, thank you very much. Um, I now yield to the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Burton. Is Mr. Lewis lying? With respect to what, sir? I said, is Mr. Lewis lying when he tells this committee that uh, you put pressure on him along with Mr. Paulson? All I know is that I never said that I would uh, replace the board and management if he invoked the MAC. What did you say? I mean, you know, sometimes there's an implication without a direct uh, order. I expressed concerns about the effects of invoking the MAC both on the financial system and on the Bank of America itself. I uh, expressed those concerns, which is appropriate, but it was always his decision whether or not to go ahead and take that decision. Did Mr. Paulson lie when he told uh, Mr. Cuomo uh, that uh, he was acting under your suggestions or orders uh, to tell them that, that the board would be fired if they didn't uh, comply? I believe he's modified that statement. I did not tell him. I did not tell Mr. Paulson. What did you tell him? I didn't tell him anything like that. We, what we did you tell him? If you say you didn't tell him anything like that, what did you tell him? Mr. Paulson and I had frequent conversations on a variety of matters given our con common concerns about the financial system. All I can say is I'm sure that I never told him to convey such a message to Ken Lewis. Mr. Paulson says In a letter from New York Attorney General Andrew Cuomo to Congress, Cuomo reports that Paulson told him that Paulson made the threat at the request of Bernanke. That's not correct? No. Did you say he, mod you said he modified his statement? How did he modify his statement? We don't have any, any information. He, he issued a statement to the effect that he did not receive that information from me, that he made inferences. But he did not, uh, he, as far as I know, he modified his statement uh, uh, on that particular issue. How about uh, uh, Mr. Lacker? Is he lying? He's summarizing a long conversation. I don't recall exactly what was Just said. Just had a long talk with Ben. Says they think the Mac threat is irrelevant because it's not credible. Also intends to make it even more clear that if they play the card, play that card, and then need assistance, management is gone. You didn't say anything like that. I don't know if I did or not. Now, you know, one of the things, I was chairman of this committee for six years, and we did a lot of investigating. One of the things that I learned was, in order to keep people from perjuring themselves, they couldn't remember anything. Are you sure you can't remember? I'm sure I can't remember. But I think it's important to note that whatever conversation I had with Mr. Lacker, who is a Federal Reserve official, that I did not, in subsequent conversations with Mr. Lewis, did not make that threat. Why did you keep the SEC in the dark? Did not keep the SEC in the dark. We were working carefully and closely with our other regulatory agencies. The agencies that were most relevant for the Bank of America discussion were those that were involved in uh, regulating the Bank of America and in the transaction. That would have been the Treasury, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, and the Office of Control of Currency, who were well informed. Well, according to the New York Attorney General, Mr. Cuomo, Hank Paulson said, 
that, that he intentionally kept the SEC out of the loop about your efforts to push the Bank of America merger with Merrill Lynch. This seems to be backed up by the following exchange between your general counsel, Scott Alvarez, and a New York Fed, Fed official. The New York Fed officials asked, have we conveyed anything to the SEC regarding the Bank of America situation? They know something's up. How much, if anything, has been shared with the SEC? Mr. Alvarez replied, I have not discussed this with the SEC. Bank of America has complained that someone did talk to the SEC with the result that the SEC called late last week to say that they heard the Bank of America was negotiating a city-type deal with the U.S. government and to ask Bank of America to explain the unexpectedly high losses at Merrill Lynch. You didn't direct any of those? Uh, I did not. Does, 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 does this Mr. Alvarez work for you? Who, he does. He does? He did this on his own? Again, I would emphasize that the issues at hand did not indirectly involve the SEC. They well, involved are, the OCC. Are, are, are you his boss? I'm sorry? Are you his boss? Yes. Mr. Alvarez? I am. Would he do something like this, make this kind of a statement that uh, could cause these kinds of problems without your authority? I didn't have any knowledge of this particular exchange. And again, the rationale for it, I, as I understand now, having discussed it with him, is that the agencies that were relevant to our transaction were the FDIC, the OCC, and the Treasury. That's the ones that we kept closest in uh, communication. What's that? Gentlemen's time has expired. Um, Mr. Foster, Illinois. Um, thank you for appearing here, Chairman Bernanke. I, I appreciate it, and I'm sure everyone here. What the microphone is this? Working? Okay. Um, just for clarity, see if, he, see if and, your mic is on. Foster. Yeah. Is this is this working here? Okay. All right. I assume I'll, sp I'll speak loudly. Um, just for clarity, at any point in these negotiations, did you or anyone you know of point out to Mr. Lewis that the government agencies had the power to remove him and or the Bank of America board? I did not. Okay. Now, without any specific reference to the case at hand, do you believe that there are circumstances in which the CEO of a systemically important firm might be expected to have his shareholders take a bullet to protect the overall health of the economy in a crisis situation? No. That's not, uh, that's not appropriate under supervisory uh, practice, and we have not done that. Okay, and so you, do you believe that there is any need for any additional legal clarity about the duties of a CEO to the shareholders, to the regulators, and to the overall economy in times of systemic crisis? Well, that might be something for Congress to consider, but I think the rules as they currently stand are quite clear that you can't force somebody to take actions against the interest of their own company for systemic reasons alone. Okay, so you did not sense at any time in this that there were ambiguities that um, would be better if they were, had, had been made explicit in law? It was always clear uh, in our thinking and in our advice to Mr. Lewis that it was not just an issue of the financial system but also an issue of Bank of America specifically that was at risk and that he should take that into consideration when he made his decision. Right, so it was the indirect benefit to the shareholders from not having the whole system collapse that, Correct. that he was optimizing for. Yeah. Okay. And now, if you accept that the federal recapitalization of both Merrill and Bank of America were, were probably inevitable, um, do you think that the net effect of the merger was just represented a reshuffling around of the total funds that we'd eventually have to commit? Or, or do you think it's a more complicated situation than that? No, I think the combination strengthened the two companies. And in particular, what we learned during the crisis was that the investment banking model was not very stable, that it was subject to funding problems. By combining with Bank of America with a large retail deposit base, it was possible to solve some of those funding problems to some extent. Okay. Well, thanks again. I yield back the remainder of my time. I yield to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Bernanke, let me, uh, let me go back to what I think sort of starts this pattern of pressure on behalf of the government, pattern of intimidation dealing with Bank of America. I want to go back to the October 13th uh, initial meeting that my understanding is you, Mr. Paulson, Ms. Baer, uh, Mr. Geithner had the nine biggest banks come here to Washington. Was, was that meeting at, at, was that something you and Mr. Paulson decided needed to happen or was that your call, his call? How'd that, how'd that happen? 
My recollection is Mr. Paulson's decision, but we all participated in that meeting. Okay. Mr. Lewis, his testimony a few weeks ago, he said the meeting, um, he described the meeting as the four of you on one side, the nine CEOs of the banks on the other. They were given a form to sign where they had to write in the amount of, of uh, uh, TARP money, uh, bailout money that they, they felt that was uh, needed or that you suggested. Um, the impression he left with this committee was that they had to comply. In fact, I asked him personally, I said, did anyone express any reservations at that meeting about accepting taxpayer money? He said, yes, one, one of the uh, uh, other CEOs, in fact, did express reservations. Nevertheless, they, they signed that. He also indicated that the entire meeting um, took less than an hour. Is that an accurate description of, of what took place at that meeting? I think the time was less than an hour, yes. And he also said, when I asked him, did he know what the meeting was going to be about when he came here to, to Washington, he informed the committee that he had no idea it was going to be about signing a form uh, being forced to accept uh, TARP money. Is that, is that accurate? I don't know. Well, let me ask it this way. Did you inform the nine uh, CEOs of the banks who were called to Washington that the meeting was going to be about them taking uh, TARP money from the uh, legislation that had just uh, enabled that to happen that frankly had just been passed less than two weeks prior to that? I, I was not in contact with the nine CEOs. I think the Treasury was in contact with them. Is it, do, do you believe that Mr. Paulson let him know what the meeting was about? I don't know. Okay. Um, but, you, but, but the recollection of, the, of, the, of how I described the meeting, how Mr. Lewis described the meeting, that's in fact what took place that day. Less than an hour, nine CEOs given a form they had to sign saying they were going to take a certain amount of government money. Mr. Paulson strongly urged them to take capital and argued that given the, what was going on in the world at that time, which was a global financial crisis, that it was very much in their interest and in the interest of the financial system for them okay. to do so, and they, they signed the forms. Again, Mr. Lewis felt like they, they had to sign that form, had to, had to comply based on the testimony he gave this committee. Then we jump forward two, two, months, uh, uh, two months ahead to December, and we have the, uh, the email that, uh, and letter that Mr. both Mr. Issa and, and Mr. Burton had brought up, the letter that Mr. Cuomo, New York AG, sent to uh, members of Congress uh, where he said, Secretary Paulson has informed us that he made the, the, the threat dealing with the Merrill Lynch acquisition uh, at the request of Chairman Bernanke. We also have the, uh, the email from Mr. Lacker, the Richmond Fed chairman, talking about, just had a long talk with Mr. Bernanke, says that I think the MAC threat is irrelevant because not credible, also intends to make it even more clear that if they play that card and they need assistance, management is going, a uh, gone, excuse me. And then um, the third one I would point out, too, is, is the... Um, email from Mr. Angulo at the New York Fed, which uh, deals with the disclosure concern. Uh, also, this is in uh, December of uh, last year, where he says, I think I'll ask uh, Merrill Lynch, the current estimate of the fourth quarter, and he, he makes a statement, if I get a sense that Merrill Lynch is leaning toward an early January filing, I'll try to steer them toward a later filing. I mean, I guess what I'm trying to point out is it, you have all this, this, this pattern here and uh, which, which, as I asked Mr. Lewis uh, when, when he was here, uh, if, if what took place at the October 13th had, a, had an impact on his decision making, his, his thought process as he moves through this, this dealings in December with you and with Treasury relative to the, um, relative to the Merrill Lynch acquisition. Uh, do you see how a reasonable person could reach the, uh, the, the conclusion that there in fact was this pattern of pressure from the government? No, not if, not if you're sufficiently informed. Um, as I said, I did not tell Mr. Paulson to convey any threats. The email from Mr. Lacker was a summary of a long conversation. It very in explicitly said that, that problems with the management would be related to their needing assistance in an yeah, emergency but, situation. And but, as but, I said, 